today by singing Top Rock Free Song Common Thread, and Elaine's going to show you how you can participate in this. Well, I'm not a sign language interpreter, but I've learned a few signs. We will rise all together. Just take your fists together, okay, and make the circle all together. We will rise. Want to practice? We will rise all together. We will rise. If you want to mouth the word, you can. But we're not supposed to say it. <laughs> Enjoy it! <laughs> In a many color garden, we are growing side by side. We will rise all together, we will rise. If the sun and rain on us are broken in the night, we will rise all together, we will rise. We will rise like the ocean, we will rise. Thank you. Well, good morning, and welcome to this service of the Unitarian Society of New Haven. I'm Jim Peters, co-chair of the Worship Committee, and it's my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. If you're here for the first time, I welcome you especially to our gathering. 
and want you to know there'll be a welcome table set out set up outside after the service. If you have any questions about USNH or just want to know a little bit more about us, please stop. I welcome all near and far to this community where we value and respect our differences as we seek to create a more just, equitable, inclusive world. In this community, black lives matter. As our mission statement attests, we are a diverse, multi-generational faith community that inspires lives of compassion and generosity, nurtures spiritual growth, cultivates transformative connections, and creates a more just world. I'm so glad we can worship in person together this morning, and thanks to our technical team, we are live streaming this service via Zoom and on YouTube. We welcome all who are with us virtually as well as physically this morning. For those in the sanctuary today, a few reminders. Just as in bygone days, now is the time to put your devices securely into worship mode. And what's new these days, of course, is the use of masks. Please, while you are inside today, for your safety and that of others, please keep your mask over your nose and your mouth at all times. We've relaxed the restroom rules to allow more than one person at a time. That's only going to be safe if we continue to be masked up there as well. Also, for the time being, we're asking those not in the choir, please, to sing along silently during the hymns. When our service concludes, we, of course, encourage socializing, but please make getting outdoors your first priority. That's the safest location for greeting old friends and making new ones. Now today, of course, is a very special day in the life of the Unitarian Society of New Haven. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, we will celebrate the installation of the Reverend Linda Susan V. Ulrich as the sixth settled minister here at USNH. And just to prove that it's a big weekend, this last Thursday, November 11th, marked the 70th anniversary of our formal gathering as a community. Many people over many months have been planning for this day. We had hoped back in the heady days of June that we would be able to have a, a gala 70th birthday party this weekend. But as the weeks passed, it became clear that a big indoor dining event just wouldn't be safe enough to consider now. As we let that hard truth settle in our bones, our group did come to a realization this big birthday doesn't have to be celebrated all at once. Instead, as the year continues to unfold, we'll have time to reflect on our past in many different and creative ways. And when the science tells us it's safe, we can have that birthday party hopefully in the spring. This morning, we seek to honor our seven decades of history in a special way. Thanks to Jane and Dick Platt and many others, we have in our possession a vast archive of material dating from our earliest days as a gathered community. With the help of a diligent team of archival excavators coordinated by Cindy Chelkin, we will this morning hear from each of our previous five settled ministers, and then we'll hear words from our about-to-be sixth settled minister as well. These are pieces of sermons or other materials. It's just a tiny sampling, but we felt that each of these voices across seven decades should today be here heard once again in our midst. So friends, this morning we attend to our past with respect and appreciation, knowing that our present and our future don't just arrive, they emerge out of a context, out of a shared history. Ours is a story that continues to be written. Come, let us look ahead with confidence and resilience and openness, informed and supported and strengthened by where we have been. Come, let us worship together. Our chalice lighting this morning comes from Reverend Karen G. Johnston. As we gather this morning, let us be a people of not forgetting. Let us practice 
holding collective memories <clears throat> that might otherwise slip into that enormous void that sucks at and corrodes any future we hold dear. Let us practice honoring truth-telling up from the past that must come fully into the now, lest we falter and fail, lest the whole remain in pieces. Let not our need for comfort or simplicity, for easy forgiveness or false pardon, smother the heartbreak that still needs healing. Let us practice resilience with reckoning. Let us marry memory and promise. Let us dance in the tension we find there. Let us rest in the integrity we cultivate there. Let us be partners with the possibility that emerges there. It is good we gather. Hi, I'm Bruce Levison. I served on our original Right Relations Task Force, which formed approximately 17 years ago. The covenant we use today evolved out of this work, which we did together as a community. If you wish to see the full text of our covenant, it's available on the USNH website. Covenant lies at the center of how Unitarian Universalists gather in community. We are united not by a particular set of beliefs, but by the promises we make about how we will be together, how we will treat each other, and how we will seek to mend relations when we fall short of our aspirations. Each week we recite together as a brief version of our covenant, I encourage you to read the full covenant on our website. While the following words express our intentions in writing, our true covenant lies and breathes in our actions. Please join me now in reciting the words that appear in your order of service or in the chat on the live stream. Begin. We covenant together in reciting the, I'm sorry, to, we covenant together to create and nurture a culture of respect and kindness and to engage in the spiritual and everyday practice of loving more generously. To this end, we will strive to be open, value differences, listen deeply, use kind language, speak our truths, work with conflict, seek humor and joy. As Jim mentioned, for now we ask that you refrain from singing along with the hymn as Erica and I sing, but we invite you to listen, uh, meditate on the words, or contemplate the music as you wish. We gather together in joyful thanksgiving, acclaiming creation whose bounty we share. Both sorrow and gladness we find now in our living. We sing a hymn of praise to the life that we bear. We gather together to join in the journey, confirming, committing our passage to be a true affirmation in joy and tribulation when bound to human care and hope, then we are free.
Friends, we gather this morning knowing that some of us are carrying sorrow so profound, they seek the support of this beloved community to bear the burden. Others hold joys so great, they yearn to shout them to the heavens. I'd like to share myself the joy I feel around our 70th. I, you know, I can't decide if it's an anniversary or a birthday. I keep going back and forth, but whatever we call it, it feels like an amazing achievement, and I feel very joyful about that. I invite you into a spirit of meditation, prayer, or contemplation of ultimate things. For some of us, 70 years is easy to imagine because that birthday is in the rearview mirror. For others, 70 years is a length of time that's nearly unfathomable. Today, I invite you to contemplate what has happened during that period for this congregation. The children born, the couples celebrating their relationships, the families mourning a loved one, the laughter, the arguments, the musicals, the budget discussions, the breathtaking moments and sorrowful disappointments perfectly placed word, the sacred silences. As we spend some time in that silence, let any stray sound take you deeper inward. Let us share some sacred silence together. Returning from the silence, returning to this space, surrounded by those who wish you well. May you be nourished by the history of those who came before. Amen. U.S.N.H.'s 
first settled minister who served from 1952 to 1954 was the Reverend Lester Clark Lewis, PhD. Although we don't have any of Dr. Lewis's sermons in the archive, we did have an order of service with, from his installation on January 25th, 1953. These excerpts come from the history included in the order of service in the installation vows between the minister and the congregation. The first reading. It was outside agencies that set us going. A group of local churches made a survey on church attendance and found 65 unchurched Unitarians. This figure reached Boston where the American Unitarian Association rose to it like a sheet of paper before a strong wind. <laughs> Mr. Monroe Husbands of the Church Extension Department hastened down to New Haven and collected some of the 65 in the home of Mr. John Whiting in July of 1949. We would be a fellowship crystallis stage of Unitarianism. So we became a fellowship and were placed under the tutelage of the nearest Unitarian minister, Mr. Mason Miller of the Hartford Church. Mr. Miller preached to us, answered our bumbling questions, and endeared himself to us all. Mrs. Mayor Oakes joined us said we were neglecting the children in proposed a church school. To accomplish this, we changed our hour to four in the afternoon. The fellowship and the school were advertised in the papers and attendance grew. The chrysalis was beginning to burst. Good morning. During his installation in January of 1953, Reverend Dr. Lewis made this commitment. It is with a deep sense of responsibility that I enter upon the ministry to which you have called me. I pledge myself worthily to employ freedom in the pulpit and the truth in love without fear of persons or position to seek yet more light and truth, to fulfill the duties of my ministry, and in all things so to live as to promote righteousness, peace, and love among all people. In turn, the congregation pledged that, quote, together we would inspire all to use the wisdom of all the past, the discoveries of the present, and our hopes for the future. The Reverend Wayne Chatee became USNH's second settled minister in 1955 and served until 1985. This sermon comes, this excerpt comes from a sermon entitled Worship, Who, How, and Why, delivered on January 20th, 1980. Worship can be, as it has been in the past, a deliberate effort to understand and appreciate with all one's being those aspects of experience, those realities in the universe on which we feel ourselves to be most dependent for our well-being and growth. It can be, as it has been in the past, a motivating force which enables us not only to appreciate and celebrate these aspects of life, but which relates us to them in ways which draw from us activities and responses that change our lives and the life of the world. What we are trying to do when we worship is to sharpen our thoughts, increase our understanding, enlarge our framework of reference, 
to remind ourselves that there is something in the world and in our experience on which we are dependent for life and growth, out of which has come the whole evolution of the human community, from which comes the inspiration that leads to the great ideas of the human spirit, which move our emotions and feelings to their greatest depths, out of which has come the possibility for one human creature to relate to another in the daring of openness that lays one prey to suffering and loss, but which also gives one the opportunity to grow in experience and expand in a way not possible otherwise. And so we come together to celebrate, to sing and speak the words which say what we believe about life, to share our thoughts as we think together on what life is, about what it could be, and what we want it to be and about how maybe we can work a little harder to see that it becomes that way. Let us therefore worship in spirit and in truth, for in such worship we shall fulfill ourselves. We shall bless our world, and we shall bequeath a heritage to those yet to come, which shall indeed be for a blessing. Good morning, I'm Jane Platt. I'm here because of my belief. I belonged to a congregational church, but was not a Christian. I was totally creeped out by the, con the crucifixion. I was nine years old. Uh, my parents found out about USNH from a friend, and I was happy not to have to translate anymore. I came here when I was nine and had to wait until 1958, when I was eight, 16, to become an official member. The USNH members became like extra parents to me and my brothers at a time when we really needed it. We felt loved, valued, and supported. I sang in the junior choir and was in the liberal religious group, youth group. I went to Roe Camp in 1957. Dick and I met here and married in 1965. Ours was the first wedding in the Chati Social Hall. Wayne Chati officiated at our wedding and later dedicated our sons Richard in 1967 and James in 1970. I've sung in the choir, been the chair of the History and Archives Committee, been a member of many other committees, I acted, sang, and sewed costumes for the Turnpike Players' productions. The productions we had always had a positive message, and there were always enough parts so that everyone could be in it, uh, from youngsters all the way up to octogenarians. Um, and so we got to know each other well, and it was a really good feeling. We all help each other here. Members make it possible for us to do social justice work. We have a food pantry, so we can contribute to that. Melinda and Sally organized a Safe for Seniors uh, protest around George Floyd's killing, and I showed up with my sign, Justice in My Lifetime. And the uh, local reporter picked up on that and said, some of these people have been protesting for decades. <laughs> this is true. Um, Sharon and Tanisha run Waverly, and that gives me the uh, ability to read to the children and knit scarves and hats for them. And I got my Black Lives Matter pin here. As time went on, I became clearer about my beliefs, but in this religion, that's a job that doesn't stay done. This feels like a close family that helps me be my best self. As you can tell, Jane and I have been here since the beginning. <laughs> My family were longtime active members of the Congregational Church in Milford. I recall as a child wondering why there were so many different churches and religions which sometimes bickered or even fought each other. Wasn't it more important to lead good lives, treat each other fairly, not to lie or cheat? and so on. 
My father became interested in Unitarianism during the 1940s and joined the Unitarian Church of the Larger Fellowship because there was no congregation near us. Soon the members from Connecticut were meeting together and occasionally visiting the Unitarian churches in Hartford and New London, which were the only Unitarian churches in the whole state at that time. As our group grew, the Fairfield County members formed the Westport Church, and the New Haven area members, along with like-minded others, formed USNH. I now was in a church that was to my liking. I have been an active member ever since. It is here that I met my wife, Jane, whose parents were also early members. I consider this my longtime second home. So my task right now is to make a smooth transition from the testimonial to the offering, but pretty much all I have to do is say, Amen. <laughs> I mean, if, if that doesn't show what is possible in this gathered community, the lives enriched by what we do here, the lives changed by what we do here, the lives saved, literally, by what we do here, then there's nothing else I can say. I hope that you will be as generous as you can be. We're not passing the plate for, for COVID purposes, but afterwards there will be people who will collect your offering. And for those on the live stream, if you go to usnh.org, there's a donate button there. You can also send checks to USNH at 700 Hartford Turnpike, Hamden, Connecticut, 06517. So thank you, Jane and Dick, for your testimonial, not only about what stewardship means to you, but the testimonial of your lives and what this community has become through you. Amen. Can I get an amen?
Reverend Daniel D. Hotchkiss served USNH from 1987 to 1990 as the congregation's third settled minister. The first sermon excerpt comes from the Ministry of Music, delivered on December 4, 1988. The second excerpt comes from the New England Heart, delivered on February 6, 1989. What's most important to me as a minister is that the musical work is so deeply related to the whole work of the church. The work of the church is to be a caring community, a transforming community, and a worshiping community. Our music program does all three. Our feeling of the power of music probably is rooted deep in our personal and evolutionary histories. Our earliest sensations are of rhythm, mother's heartbeat. Tempos faster than a heartbeat raise our tension. Slower tempos build suspense. Tempos of 70 to 80 beats per minute feel about right. The ministry of music touches what is common in us all. It, it reaches back into our personal and evolutionary histories and reminds us of the deepest rhythms of reality. At the same time, it climbs to the heights of style and refined feeling and high culture, reminding us that those heights must be climbed again and again by every generation. It comes very close to touching in its harmony and dissonance the order and disorder of the universe, in its melody the stories of creation, in its rhythm the heartbeat of a God who is within us all. Pope John Paul II, when he visited York Cathedral in England some years ago, prayed, then paused and said, prayer is important. Prayer is very important. But singing, ah, singing is more important. <laughs> he, he then announced the singing of a hymn. Can you imagine the power and the spirit with which that congregation then sang? David Rankin, a Unitarian Universalist minister who has served churches in San Francisco, Atlanta, and Grand Rapids once remarked that every community has its characteristic spiritual problem. In San Francisco, it was rootlessness. In Atlanta, it was ambition. In Grand Rapids, it was guilt. In every case, the problem has a flip side. In San Francisco, the flip side of rootlessness was freedom. In Atlanta, the flip side of ambition was productivity. And in Grand Rapids, the flip side of guilt was an admirable sense of responsibility. I've only had two ministries, but so far, my experience bears Rankins out. In Boca Raton, Florida, the overwhelming spiritual problem was loneliness. There are lonely people everywhere, but all of South Florida is like a freshman mixer. <laughs> Can't take credit. <laughs> almost everybody just moved in, and almost nobody knows anybody. The flip side of loneliness is a real sociability. People look to one another for companionship, and they learn to find it in the condo association, in a golf club, or in a church. Where everyone is lonely, barriers between people come down quickly. That leaves New Haven, Connecticut. I've only been here for two years, but so far as I can see, the spiritual problem and its flip side have the same name, 
seriousness. <laughs> Holds up. Um, as a problem, I see seriousness in haggard faces struggling into evening classes and committee meetings. I see it in the fierceness with which people criticize each other sometimes in this church. I see it in the issues people bring to me in counseling. Feelings of failure, guilt for falling short of high ideals, the sense that somehow, in addition to prospering financially and caring for three children and a disabled parent, I should be doing more to change the world. Where but in New England could you have a church that has active committees for finance, office administration, worship, social responsibility, and religious education, but at the same time has a lack of volunteers to organize social activities? Our seriousness has many benefits. This church includes many people who in different ways live their ideals. Next week, we'll be hearing from some of our former Peace Corps volunteers. We have more than our share of people here whose daily work involves earnest, dedicated service. Quite a few of us are active either full or part-time in political activity. And even those of us whose work is less obviously philanthropic hold ourselves to a high standard. Talking to people, I'm reminded of those 17th century Puritans who kept meticulous journals, keeping for posterity the sins and virtues of their daily lives. Let me say, I love it here. I'm a serious person too. I don't believe in an angry, judging God, but I don't know that it would make much difference if I did. Like Henry David Thoreau, I feel obligated anyway to make my life, even in its details, worthy of the contemplation of my most elevated and critical hour. And so I'm speaking to myself as much as to anybody else when I say, take it easy. Take it a little easy on yourself and on each other. Play, relax, increase your tolerance of inconsistency and failure and disorder and deficiencies. Smell the roses and enjoy the people. Do something now and then that has no higher purpose. Good morning. Thank you. This congregation's fourth settled minister was the Reverend Kathleen McTeague, whose tenure ran from 1991 to 2012. This reading is an excerpt from The Path of Community, her sermon on February 9th, 1997. I once heard the priest and activist Henri Nouan give a workshop in which he defined the disciplines of community as forgiveness and celebration. I had to think about those two things for a long time before I understood the weight he was assigning to them. As important as forgiveness clearly is, 
I can think of a few other virtues I would rank at least as high when it comes to learning to live together in a way that strengthens and deepens the living. Love, for instance, and patience, and a finely tuned sense of humor. Humility definitely has to be in there, and probably something that could be called faithfulness. That is, the willingness to stick by one another through the rough places as well as the easy times. I suppose it could also be called stubbornness or tenacity. Nuon's focus on celebration also gave me pause. Of course we want to celebrate together, but our collective life involves a lot of sorrow as well as joy. And when we come together to grieve or to rage, it's hard to think of that under the heading celebration. But I tried to look more deeply at his reasons for choosing these two, for holding up forgiveness and celebration as the central practices. Because Henri Nouan really chose community as his spiritual path. He could have stayed in academia, where he lived and worked for many years, or he could have lived as an isolated monk, or used his fame to travel and lecture all his days. What he did instead was to become a member of a large community, a household of mentally handicapped people living in community with others not so handicapped. And it was in that context that Nuon says he came to realize that community is the clearest place in our lives for purification. It is, as he put it, the place where more often than not the person you least want to live with always seems to live. <laughs> the kind of forgiveness Nuon speaks of as a discipline for community is multiple and complex. It involves the forgiveness we have to extend to each other for the large and small humiliations that come from being so well known that our inflated images are constantly deflated. It's the forgiveness we grant each day for the small and large imperfections we encounter, and also the forgiveness we give ourselves when we bump up against each other and find our old impatience arising or our tempers flaring. It's above all the forgiveness we've got to give because the more closely we're bound to one another, the more clearly we see ourselves. We are, in a sense, mirrors for one another. And the deeper our communion with each other, the more aware we are of being travelers in one journey and sailors on one boat. Within this context, Spiritual growth is not an individual pursuit. Our forward movement is linked so thoroughly that in the end, we see that to forgive the imperfections we find out there is to forgive more deeply the ones we find in our own hearts. Celebration as a discipline is likewise multiple and complex. Celebration within the religious community is not primarily the easy kind, the kind we all fall into as second nature when we lift our voices in ready song or laughter because life is good. Celebration also comes in the whispered word, nevertheless. It is the somber and pained gathering at a time of loss, the careful lifting up of hopes and fears, when we are feeling our most fragile. 
the sturdy evocations of awe in the face of mystery both joyful and awful, celebration can sound out even in the midst of despair. Using the voice of hope, or in the midst of defeat, using the voice of comfort, or in the midst of danger, using the voice of solidarity. When a community like this one, the disciplines of forgiveness and celebration, along with all the other arts of living together, are honed and practiced on a lot of different levels, where we come together most obviously and consistently is in this room on Sunday morning. We come together as a worshiping community, and worship is therefore at the heart of what binds us together. Reverend Megan Lloyd Joyner served USNH as the fifth settled minister from 2015 to 2019. 
This sermon excerpt comes from Path of Dreams, which she delivered on March 17, 2019. What dreams have been spread before us, spread under our feet? On whose dreams do we tread, not to destroy them, but to be buoyed by them, lifted up and carried forward? And how do we teach our children that they travel a path laid not by their own labor, but by those who came before them, their ancestors by blood and those ancestors of spirit, women and men and people who fought and fight for the place, their place in the world, in a society that told them, tells them, they are less than. Women and men and people who lay a path of dreams for their children and all children to tread upon. A path even rich, richer than one woven with the gold and silver light of heaven. Let us remember the path on which we tread, a path laid by those who came before us, by our own parents and grandparents, and the ancients who stare out of black and white photos and are now the stuff of family lore. It's a path laid by our spiritual ancestors, Unitarians and Universalists, and Unitarian Universalists, <laughs> who labored for our free faith and our right to practice it. People who fought for the civil rights and human rights of the oppressed and forgotten. It's a path laid by the founders of this congregation who set out to create a society in which people would unite to express and enrich their spirituality and humanity, to seek meaning and truth in their lives, to discover, preserve, and cultivate beauty around them and within themselves to celebrate the joy of being together in song and story, myth and meditation, to continue religious education for themselves and their children, to foster tolerance and welcome diversity, to form a loving community that manifests this love in caring acts, and to work courageously for justice and peace in our world. That is the purpose of the Unitarian Society of New Haven, as outlined in our by bylaws. It is, if we look at it in the right light, a path of dreams. It shimmers beneath our feet and stretches far into the distance, inviting us, daring us to follow it. Good morning. These words of Reverend Linda Susan Ulrich are excerpted from Love is the Root of Nonviolence, February 14, 2021. One question that has plagued me over the last few years is what happens to nonviolent resistance when your opponents seem to have no integrity, or at the very least are willing to ignore their consciences to pursue their selfish goals, whatever the cost. How can moral suasion work on people who demonstrate a lack of moral compass? As I've watched recent victories for fairness unfold, despite widespread efforts to suppress them, the recent voter turnout in Georgia leaps to mind, I'm reminded of one of my all-time favorite physics metaphors. Force equals mass times acceleration. There have been so many forces out there trying to push us past on voting rights, push us into the past on voting rights, on international asylum agreements, on climate change, and many, many more. 
When we're trying to counter people in power who would use force against us, it can feel like we're pushing back on so many fronts that we can't build up enough speed to make a difference. Here's the thing, though. If you can't increase your acceleration, then you need to increase your mass. You need to get more people involved. You need to have more and more communities joined in solidarity and pushing back against oppression. Those recent victories I mentioned are rooted in relationships. A voter receiving a handwritten postcard in the mail, or getting a phone call to help them find their polling place, or talking with a volunteer at a campaign event. And those relationships, those brief approximations of the beloved community, and more mass to the mass movements for justice. I want to point out something in this formula that looks tiny, but has significant implica implications. Um, do you see those little arrows over the F and the A? They indicate that force and acceleration are vectors, which just means that they have directionality to them, as well as magnitude. How that applies to our metaphor is that as we add more and more people who are going in the same direction we are, who are pushing with the same purpose, our collective force becomes focused and moves us closer to the beloved community. And when the force is, we exert is motivated by love, if it's Gandhi's satyagraha, or soul force, then the ends we achieve are imbued with love rather than tainted by violence. Maybe not all of us can have the kind of historical influence that Dr. King had, but we can all be part of building the beloved community. After all, before Dolores Huerta helped organize the United Farm Workers, she was a teacher. Before anyone had heard of Dorothy Day, she was a single mom. Before Desmond Tutu's name became well known, he was a priest. Ordinary people who committed themselves to a larger purpose. So why not you? Why not me? Why not all of us together? This be a house of peace, of nature and humanity, of sorrow and elation. Let this be our house, a haven for the healing, an open room for question and our inspiration. Let this be a house of peace. Let this be a house of peace. Let this be a house of peace. Let this be a house of freedom. Guardian of dignity and worth held deep inside us. Let this be a house. A platform for the free voice Where all our sacred differences You shall not divide us Let this be a house of peace Let this be a house of peace Let this be a house of peace Let all in this house seek truth where scientists and mystics abide in reverence here. Let this be our house, the house of our creation, where works of art and melodies consecrate the atmosphere. Let this be a house of peace. Let this be a house of peace. Let this be a house of peace. Let 
this be a house of prophecy. May vision for our children be a common theme. Let this be our house of myth and lore and legend, our trove of ancient story and cradle of our tender dreams. Let this be a house of peace. 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 As Susan extinguishes our chalice, would you please read together with me the words in our order of service? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Friends, it is good to look back on where we've come from, to see the path that has been forged on our behalves, the place that people built before most of us were born. <laughs> when you've got founders in the house, what do you do? <laughs> but like those famous trees, planted by people who will never know their shade, we now are the inheritors of that legacy, and we build what comes next. So let us do so with courage and with kindness, that this place, this house of peace, may be a blessing to the world. Amen, and blessed be. Amen.